Well, howdy, everyone. I am Michael Hingson, sometimes known as Mike Hingson. We were just having a discussion about that, our guest and I, because if I say Mike Hingson, people always want to say Kingson instead of Hingson. A little factoid, but it's actually Hingson with an H. So I've learned to say Michael Hingson. Took a while to figure that out, but here we are. Anyway, I would like to welcome you to Unstoppable Mindset, where inclusion, diversity, and the unexpected meet. We've got a lot of things about a lot of that today. I really appreciate you listening in and hope that you like what we have to go through today. I'd like you to meet our guest, Mila Miller, who lives in Toronto. Be confident and kind. And he's going to tell us about that as we go through the hour or so that we spend. But for now, Mila, I want to welcome you and thank you for joining us. Yeah. Thank you, Michael, for having me. I'm very happy to chat with you this evening. Uh, my time here in Toronto. Yes. I think I've learned how to say that. Toronto, they they kind of let the, the, the words yeah mumble together. I'm I'm getting better at it. I'm practicing. Is that like in Maryland? It's Baltimore. That's right. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Baltimore. Tr- so um yeah, it's it's a pleasure to be with you. I I love your story and and what this podcast is all about. And anxious to dig into uh to BCK and what that means to me and hopefully anyone listening today that might be intrigued by our mission. Of course, everybody always wanting to be different and all that. We know it's not pronounced Worcester in Massachusetts. It's Worcester. There you go. I don't know that one. I haven't been there yet, but maybe someday I'll get to. Oh, you should go. It's well, it's it's actually Worcester, but of course, when you live in Massachusetts, it's Worcester. Worcester. Okay. Worcester. Is this the same as, as, as in Texas, we say Worcestershire sauce is like the Worcester sauce. Is it the same thing or no? Well, same spelling, but uh, yeah. yeah. Um, but in Massachusetts, it's when you live there at Worcester. Worcester. Okay. Worcester. There you go. <laughs> See, you're going to make it. You might make it as a Massachusetts person yet. Well, thanks again for being here. Why don't we start by you telling us a little bit about you growing up and kind of the early Milam and all that sort of stuff? Sure. Happy to, you know, rewind the clock. Um so I tell everyone I am a Texan in Toronto, <laughs> originally from the big, great state of Texas, uh, grew up in a small town. Um, I was actually born in a town that everyone knows called Waco, Texas. <laughs> um, unfortunately, it's made headlines for not always the best of reasons, although I'd like to think Chip and Joanna Gaines and other people in the Waco community yes. have really put it on the map for delightful things like making your home more um more enjoyable to be in. So it's, of course, uh, of course, did you ever know Chip and Joanna? You know, I can't say I haven't met them. So if this podcast reaches them, Hey Chip, Hey Joanna, I, I let's, let's meet old friends. I love what y'all have done in the community. Yeah. Uh, I still have family in Waco. My grandparents have been married for 70 years. Um, they're both in their nineties now and sharp as attack. I'm very grateful to have them in my life. They, high school sweethearts met at Baylor. Um, my father comes from that side of the family. He also went to Baylor, met my mom there. And then here, I, here I am. So you would think that I would have gone to Baylor, but we decided to move South to central Texas. And I became a longhorn, a proud one at that. Wow. So I bleed orange, the school of Matthew McConaughey and many others. So I spoke, uh, several years ago f- or um, a couple of meetings at the San Francisco Light, or excuse me, the Fort Worth Lighthouse for the Blind, mm. and the CEO is from TCU. So I am obligated to talk about go frogs. You know, there you go. My <laughs> my mom is from Fort Worth, and my in laws actually, my sister in law and brother in law um, are both uh, TCU alum. They were at the national championship this year. So I was happy to see them as much as it hurt a little bit that Texas wasn't back there. Um, I was happy to see a Texas school make it that far. Yeah. I'll, I was disappointed that USC didn't go all the way, but you know, we try. There you go. There you go. There is next year. That's right. There's, it, you know, that's what gives Dallas Cowboys fans hope. There's always next year <laughs> <laughs> in Massachusetts. I lived there for three years and I remember Every year when the Red Sox started their season Mm -hmm. in the first game, if they lost, everyone started saying, wait till next year. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Tough Mm -hmm. crowd. Tough crowd. That's right. right. So anyway, so you became a Longhorn. That's right. You've got it. I studied finance at um, Macomb School of Business at UT Austin. And I got to be honest, Michael, it was not for me. I hated it. (laughs) 
without a shadow of the doubt. I, my dad was a finance guy and, um, I remember, I recall at the time there being a lot of pressure within the McCombs community. It had the top rated accounting program in the country and it was a big pipeline to go to the big four accounting firms. And then many people, um, of course, studied finance too and wanted to go work on Wall Street. Coincidentally, I was in college in 2008 during the the financial crisis, the big collapse. And uh, I didn't honor that gut intuition that told me finance wasn't for me. I, I thought I wanted to do management because I love people. And I was told that was too woo-woo or maybe not practical enough. Um, and marketing, I found really interesting, but again, also was told there's so many marketers out there. So I didn't didn't honor my own intuition. And that was a great learning lesson um, in my own life to to get in touch with my intuition and not neglect it like I did at that point in time. You know, we all too often tend not to, to pay attention to our intuition, to our own consternation. I, I love to use the example of I, I watch or not watch, but I play a lot of Trivial Pursuit. I haven't so much lately. But invariably, both for me and for other people, while we're playing it, somebody asks a question and the answer pops into a person's head, mm. whoever is having the question asked of them. And they go, no, it can't be that easy. And they don't answer it that way. And invariably, what popped into their head was the right answer. Mm. Mm. And that happens so often. It's all because we really do know more than we think we know. We just don't always tend to want to pay attention and recognize that maybe our intuition and God and all that are are really giving us the answers. So I'm glad that you learned a lesson from that. That's right. That's right. And I will say this. I don't know if I knew the right answer at that point, but I knew it. what it wasn't. I knew it wasn't finance, right? And it takes, right. I think, doing the work or doing the classwork. Cause I got a D in that class. If I recall correctly, that I was like, this, this, this ain't for me. So it was a, a great experience to set me on a path that was more in alignment with my childhood dreams and aspirations, which ultimately led me not into finance, but into the sports career. And that's where I got my start. And so what did you do in the sports world? Yeah. Thank you for asking. Good question. Um, so bad news. I'm a Yankees fan. I heard you mention the Red Sox earlier and you're wearing my favorite color red today. So if, if you are a Red Sox fan, I apologize. Michael. Nope, I'm a Dodger fan, but that's you're a Dodger okay. Fan. Okay. Well, that makes more sense. But to all the, the Red Sox listeners out there, they've won a couple of championships, you know, since then. So they I think, have. Uh, you know, the, the, the rivalry is, is maybe not as heated or the curse as it once was. Right. Um, but I grew up a big Derek Jeter fan and also being a fan of the University of Texas, Roger Clemens came over yeah. to the Yankees. And I still remember when I was a kid sitting right field behind Paul O'Neill and just being in the bleachers. And I was like, this is so epic. And they were winners. They were, they were a team and there were so many great leaders on that team. Yeah. And I've always been enamored by, by leadership and, and teamwork. So I thought I'm going to move to New York and work for the New York Yankees. Done. Signed, sealed, delivered. Very clear and specific ambition. Uh, what unfolded for me was not that. <laughs> as, as our life life journey happens, I um, uh, upon graduating UT, I, my criteria for uh, a job was twofold: live in New York City and work in sports. Um, my entry point into the industry was actually through an agency that did sponsorship activation. Uh, so if, if Models is a sponsor of the New York Yankees, I know a lot of people know that retailer in the New York mm -hmm. area, or let's say it's uh, Miller Lite as their official beer. I, uh, I was handling a lot of those contracts, but more specifically in the golf space. And, yeah. And what yeah. else? I'm sure you're thinking, yeah, I've, I, maybe I've got you on the edge of your seat. Um, I actually had a colleague who worked for the Yankees and she'd come over to our agency and hearing her firsthand accounts of what it was like to um, to work for a family run business, the Steinbrenners, right? And yeah. kind of the change of power at that time from uh, Mr. Steinbrenner passing away to his sons. I decided, I made the conscious decision at that point in time that that was my passion. And a lot of my favorite players, I mentioned Eric Cheater, Mariano yeah. Rivera, Andy Pettit, they were all retiring. And I didn't really want to see under the hood of 
the business side of things, my passion. Mm. And, and a lot of it, I, you know, it's come out in recent years, the captain, the the uh, docu-series about Derek Cheater, just about his his contract negotiation as he was aging. I thought maybe it's better I keep that my passion and I can go there and ignorance is bliss and I cheer on my team without knowing the the politics and inner workings of it being my my employer. Um, and so, yeah, I was open to opportunities and New York's a great market to be in if you're open to opportunities. Yeah. And so what did you do? Ooh, so what did I do? I did the work. I I um, was responsible for activating Omega the or Omega, however you pronounce it, the luxury timepiece company. I always tell people this is a, a fun case study. People know of Omega from the Olympics. They've had a long-standing association with the touchpads and the pools when Michael Phelps' fingers hit the touchpad and he wins gold. Um, or when Usain Bolt leans across the line and wins yet another gold. So from a marketing perception, uh, a lot of people thought of Omega as a timekeeping company, right? They're they're accurate, precise, but they didn't think of them as a luxury timepiece business. So trying to pull away market share from Rolex, Omega decided to sponsor golf and activate around uh, the major championships. Uh -huh. So I would literally go around Michael and be wearing a red polo such as your own, because um, that's Omega's brand colors. And I would set the Swiss clocks and I'd put them on the first tee, the 10th tee, uh, the putting green. And I had to make sure that they were on time. And the, the, the most, the irony in all of this, Michael, is that I am not a punctual person at all. I am chronically late despite best efforts. Getting from point A to point B, I always underestimate time. So it was kind of a running joke in my close circles and family. How the heck did you get that job? You were never on time. You got to just stretch and grow. That's it. That's it. And it did stretch me. I, I was fortunate to travel all across the US to very remote golf uh country clubs golf course locations and i loved it it was it, it actually taught me to be on time um so i think i was on time for our call today which is is good news it's more when transports involved that i struggle uh, but i've gotten better over the years so that was a, a a good learning lesson for me so you went around to golf courses all over the country and set time pieces and uh made sure they were on time right that's right i mean there you go see yeah managed their brand identity and um it was a, a wonderful program to work on, um, but it was very much rinse and repeat. And I'm a type of person mm -hmm. that there's a time and place for certainty, but I also crave variety. And uh, while there was variety in the, the the courses that these tournaments were held at, I was looking for a little bit more of a, um, a way for my extroverted self or outgoing self to be on actually the sales side and not just mm -hmm. on the fulfillment side, activating and managing, but actually having a seat at the table, negotiating the rights. Cause I, I got to see what rights they got uh, and it got me curious, a core value of mine. I'm like, well, why didn't you negotiate rights to that? Or why does this sponsor have that? And we don't. And so that's when I realized I wanted to make a jump into in a very niche sense, sponsorship sales and sports. Um, but really just working, on behalf of a team or a rights holder, similar to the Yankees, but not the Yankees. Again, they're my passion, but somebody yeah. else. And uh, all that to say, it, 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 uh, me being open to opportunity, I got connected with a gentleman who owned a professional football club, aka soccer team overseas. And he sold me on his vision, which was to build a modern day Coliseum in Rome. That's where the team played. Mm -hmm. And coincidentally, I had gone there when I was 15. My sister graduated high school. She was 18. And we did a, a trip. First city I ever stepped foot in Europe, capital city and uh, the eternal city at that. And I didn't even know the team existed when I was 15 years old. So to hear this owner um, laying out his vision for a new stadium. I was, I was bought in. I was, I was drinking quite literally from, you know, the, the, the Roman aqueducts. I was like, <laughs> I want to take your, your vision to market and sell that on your behalf and was fortunate to do so. So when did this happen? So I went to work for, uh, the ownership group, previous one of, of AS Roma, spoiler alert back in 2016. Okay. No, excuse me. Actually, 2015. Uh, okay. 2015 is is when I went to work for them. I moved abroad in 2016. And how long were you there? 
Yeah. So there specifically is is a, a tricky answer because I didn't actually move to Rome. I, I spent the majority of my time in Rome while I was yeah. sorting out um, a British visa. But this was around the time the Brexit vote happened and getting a oh. visa was a very complex process. I also, unfortunately, did not speak Italian. Italian, yeah. <laughs> so me being in Rome uh, was not the wisest business move, being on the commercial side of the business. However, many European football clubs, Manchester United being in Manchester, they had a commercial office in London. And we saw an opportunity in the market to be the first Italian team uh, to plant roots in London. And so that's where I relocated to. Wow. Well, that was uh, was easier as long as you can speak the language. So, you uh, you you didn't ha- learn how to do New Jersey Italian. You know, forget about it and all that sort of stuff. That's right. That's right. I learned. <laughs> Did, didn't uh, learn good Italian. Yeah, perfetto. <laughs> Everything was perfect. Michael. That's a nice perfetto. thing, eh? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, how long were you over there? Because you're not there now. That's right. So I'm, I can hear my wife saying, Milo, I'm laying the plane, hurry up, um, move abroad, uh, 2016. Mm-hmm. And, uh, again, did the work. You gotta, you gotta be in it, live it to, yeah, to figure it out. And, um, a lot of life happened in those years. <laughs> my sister was diagnosed with a brain tumor in 2017 oh. that a lot of the forward progress I was feeling, it kind of stopped it to be present and attend to those needs. Um, in 2018, we made a really deep run in the UEFA Champions League, which is the top um, teams across not only Italy and Germany and France and Spain, uh, really all, all across Europe. They're they're playing one another, so it was outside of our domestic league. And uh, we beat Barcelona. They had a a player you may know, uh, a guy named Lionel Messi, who today announced yes. he's going to take his talents to South Beach, um, like another athlete did about a decade ago. Yeah. And so Messi's Messi's headed to Inter Miami, David Beckham's club, and uh, we we beat we beat FC Barcelona in the Champions League quarterfinals, only to get knocked out uh, in the semifinals by Liverpool, which also had a Boston-based owner. My my uh, our ownership group was out of Boston as well, and so it allowed us on the commercial side of the business to really capitalize on the performance side, the momentum the team was having almost going to the Champions League final uh, to secure some sponsors. And uh, that was a really, really fruitful time for us commercially. And we were still riding that wave until 2020. And Mm. you know what happened then? (laughs) Yeah, those little bugs started escaping from somewhere. Mm -hmm. That's right. That's right. Uh, now there were other like challenges at the team. I'd be remiss not to to mention, but that's the nature I think well, of. It's the nature of I think any team, and it's got yeah. its ups and downs, or any business for that matter. Even yeah, yeah. So where were you living at the time? So I was still in in London when the pandemic hit, and um, <laughs> you know I think about the the rate with which my life, the speed with which my life was moving at Michael the. The travel we were doing living in London on Europe's back doorstep, I think that March, my wife's birthday is in early March, we had a ski trip planned and that ski trip did not happen, at least for us. We uh, we we canceled. I know some people ended up going and getting stuck and that's a story for another day. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, we we were in the proper UK lockdown from middle of March until July when they lifted it. And then there was a whole start stop situation from then on. Yeah. And of course there were additional lockdowns and all sorts of challenges because we were still learning a lot about COVID. And I think we're still going to continue to learn a lot about COVID, but we are a lot better situated than we were. Absolutely. Absolutely. It was a, a time of unprecedented change and I think you know from my my story, change is something that collectively we as as humans went through, at least on this planet, the collective human experience of dealing with COVID, and um, it impacted us all in in unique ways, different ways. And um, change is is hard. It's scary, and it's it's. Um, I think some people are still wrestling with the. Yep permanency of changes that caused myself included my my career changed drastically from that point onward well so 
when did you leave London and I guess move to Toronto or excuse me, Toronto? Yeah. 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 There was an intervening step. Uh, we hopped home to Texas for ah. two years, uh, 2021 and, and 2022. This Toronto opportunity came about through my wife's employer, the same one she had in London. They've been very good to us and grown her. Uh, but Toronto's new. We've only been here since the start of the year. And I, um, I've been at my own business for the last year. It was something I launched following a pandemic pivot that didn't work out and then really realizing it was time to trust my gut instincts and that intuition that I uh, got connected with in in college. And by this point in my career, I was like, it's time to bet on myself and take a leap of faith. And so that's, for you. that's how I got here. <laughs> so I a couple questions because I really want to get into change and all that, but I'm just really curious Sure. It was announced a couple of days ago that the PGA and mm. um, the other organization, what is it? Uh, Live, Live, Live Golf. Yep. Live Golf, yeah, have merged. What do you think about that? Ooh. Given especially all the furor over the last year, you've had enough connection with golf, and I assume you got to know golfers and things like that. But what do you think about that? Yeah, you know, great question. This will be, it's all still so fresh. That, yeah. uh, that news was announced yesterday. I got yeah. the... I saw it first. I get Wall Street Journal email alerts, and I I think I spit my coffee out, Michael. I was like, wait, what? Um, <laughs> yeah, I saw it on a CNN alert. And Sam's going, what? Yeah, yeah. I, I posted it on my Instagram pretty immediately because I, I it just was so recent. Um, I do have friends who um, are played golf in college, are professional caddies. I uh, am friendly with players on the tour. I don't have close friends, but uh, obviously it's, you know, it's humans that do extraordinary things and that's what they're out. The golfers that are out there all, are all human and we're all yeah. a, a work in progress. Um, so what do I think about it? I think that it's really unfortunate if I'm honest that, um, again, I, my calling card is leadership. I believe in dynamic leadership and servant hearted leadership and, um, without, calling out certain names. I think there was, um, pressure by the tour as a, as a, as a body, a governing body and entity, mm -hmm. not one person in particular, but I think the the tour is a collective as a unit to keep people loyal because of the history and legacy of the body and to deter them from moving to a new flashy, different format that paid better or paid well, um, with also questions about where that money was coming from. And if right. it was, in fact, sports washing. So it's for them to turn a blind eye now to that argument around sports washing. And is it clean money or dirty money to then take the money? It feels, um, it feels a little disingenuous. Like I, I would, I, if the PGA tour were on this call or was listening to this, uh, this podcast, I would say, what are your core values? What are your corporate values and how did that influence or impact this decision-making process? I'll be anxious to see how it goes over time because I think we're only starting to hear the the different sides of this and what it's going to do. But I know that sure. the whole issue of Liz Golf was was all about money. Oh yeah. And the the problem with a lot of professional sports, it seems to me, is it's way too much about money. I appreciate that players and so on do need to earn a living and they and the the better they are, the more they ought to earn. But I also think that there is just so much based on money that we're losing sight of the games and mm -hmm. um, and the activities themselves. And it's just kind of the nature of the beast. I think it's coming into the NCAA now with, of course, mm -hmm. the the better players who can now get money. And you know, we're, we're going completely away from the sports and it's just becoming much more money oriented. And I'm sure that there will be people who will disagree with me and yell at me and and so on. But when do we get back to the basics of the competition of the game? Yeah. You know, and the Olympics have done the same thing in so many, same things in so many ways too, that it's been, um, it's become very political with some countries and um, organizations have turned a blind eye to it. Yeah. When do we get back to the basic core values as, as you just said? Well, there's, there's so many stakeholders involved in yeah. sport as we know it today. And as somebody who worked closely with sponsors for years, I can only imagine if I had been representing either entity pitching from a PGA tour perspective of, 
you know us, this is what we're about, as opposed to live golf. Hey, we're new. We're going to do things different. We're going to do it better for you sponsors. We're going to give you better access to players or whatever it may be. You know, they've, they've been at odds. So now yeah. that, now that the two entities were competing against one another, now that they're, they're merging, let's think of it, of, of it as a classic M and a deal. It's two different corporate cultures. It's two different sponsorship sales styles. It's two different. So there's going to need to be a learning and development, um, function or core curriculum to really right. merge these two bodies and also do it in the name of caring about your people, your employees, uh, not just the the players on the tour that maybe you um, feel wronged because a lot of them do. But I just, I worry that there could be layoffs in the name of efficiency and productivity. And that's so unfair for um, either entity and, and skilled people that have talents that they could bring to grow the game. Because I do think at the end of the day, uh, some fans will be happy. This is a way to grow the game in a way that's that's centralized or organized. Sure, but there's a lot of stakeholders again that um, are going to be impacted by this. So just approaching it from a place of care, I think, is really important. Um, I agree. I think it's going to be very interesting to see how golf as an overall sport now changes. Um, so we have one entity again, but it's a completely different entity by any definition. And I hope that it changes for the better, but um, I I don't know enough to be able to comment on that. But I hope that in the long run, or as they say, at the end of the day, yeah, yeah. that that people will find that it really was an improvement for golf. And that has to be by actions, not by words. So we'll see what happens. That's right. Time will tell. Time, Time. will tell. Yep. But you know, you um, you talk about change, and <laughs> we've we've both experienced a lot of change. And I hear people say all the time, "The change is all around us. It's there." Mm-hmm. But yet, as you said, it's very hard. Why is change so hard? What is it that we have learned or not learned? That makes change so hard, especially even in the light of the fact that it's all around us all the time. Mm, yeah, it's such a good question. One theory I have, Michael, I think people find change hard or exhausting or challenging is because it's outside of our comfort zones. <laughs> as simple as that may sound, we we get so accustomed to doing something a certain way or conditioned to do it a certain way that it's, it becomes second nature, just what we know. And if that is taken away from us, or we're told there's a different way to do it, there's a bit of resistance or agitation. Um, I'd love to know your perspective on this, just given um, <laughs> you being on this planet, you have a little bit more wisdom than me. Uh, some years, you're a couple of years ahead of me. Um, but I, yeah, I find that change is hard for people because once we get good at something, well, that feels nice. And so to, to change it up, if it's not serving us, we start to second guess or wonder if we've made the wrong decision instead of sitting with the discomfort and agitation to a place of actually growing our comfort zones. And I think that that's really where, where growth happens is out of our comfort zone. Yeah. Uh, I think the, the issue is that our comfort zone needs to be broader. Mm. So I, I I remember after September 11th, and I've talked about it here a few times, yeah. I started hearing people say, we got to get back to normal. Mm. We got to get back to normal. We got to get back to the way normal was. And I remember that I always reacted to that. I always bristled at it. I didn't like it. Yeah. But it took me a long time to finally realize that the reason I didn't like that comment was because normal would never be the same again. Mm. And we really need to recognize that that's really what change is all about. And so what we need to do is not necessarily look for a new normal, Mm. but instead recognize that normal is evolving. Mm. And while we're comfortable doing things in a certain way, we get used to doing things in a certain way. If we don't explore how do we enhance that and make that different way or that way that we do things better, then we're going to be stuck in the same old way of doing things. So even talking about 
live golf and the PGA. Is that a good change? Is it a bad change? Time will tell. It's a change. Yeah. And um, rather than necessarily condemning it, unless you know something that others don't, the, the bottom line is with any kind of change, we need to really explore and think about how we enhance because of change. And oftentimes, how do we be the ones to bring change into the world because something has to be better? I was um, the program director at our radio station. And one of the things that I did at the station when I was program director at KUCI when I was going to college was listen to all of our DJs. And some of them really sounded horrible. They just didn't sound good. And I go, how do I deal with that? Mm -hmm. How can I get them to be better? How can mm -hmm. I make them change? And I, um, something that dawned on me is that I'm listening to them. Mm -hmm. Do they listen to themselves? Mm -hmm. And I went to them and I said, look, I want you to record your shows and I want you to go off and listen to them. And they wouldn't do that. And mm -hmm. so what we did was to, set up a, a system. I did it with Dave McHugh, our engineer. He set up a recorder in a locked cabinet because we had the locked cabinets where all the equipment was anyway. But anytime the mic was activated, the recorder would turn on. So we were able to make recordings of what the people said. We didn't really worry about, of course, the music. That wasn't what, what uh, we were worried about not evaluating, but dealing with, we wanted the announcers to get better. And I would give them each a cassette. Remember cassettes? You don't, you, you're not, I don't know if you're old enough to remember cassettes. I'm a CD guy. Yeah. There you go. See, and they're gone. But mm -hmm. uh, we would give them a, a recording of their week's shows. And I said, you've got to listen to the shows. If you don't do that, then you're not going to be able to continue to be here. But you know what? People started doing it and they started hearing what they sounded like. Mm -hmm. And by doing that, I was actually very amazed at the quality improvements mm -hmm. in most people by the end of the year when they decided that they would at least think about the change and then they embraced the change because they started hearing themselves the way other people heard them. Some mm -hmm. of those people went on into professional radio, one went to NBC and wow. their people, you know, it was really great. But we, we really, you're right. We get locked into our comfort zone, but the part of it that is the problem is we do get locked into our comfort zone and we don't think about or explore ways to enhance or improve and maybe mm -hmm. stretch our comfort zone. And that's kind of my thought. Totally. I love that word enhance and also improve. I'm curious, what was the number one thing they changed? Or rather, was there a through line of changing pitch tonality what what in perhaps there wasn't a through line it was it was uniquely individual but i i'm i want to know what that feedback you gave them resulted in uh, it was different for different people probably for most people they started saying uh, a whole lot less they actually started <laughs> completing sentences more they spoke in a more consistent way into the microphone, they became better speakers by any standard because Fantastic. they heard themselves and yeah. uh, everyone was a little bit different, but those are the, the basic things. They really became better speakers. And um, one of them actually is, a, is the, um, the main guy who does a lot of the work at one of the local planetariums. And he, uh, Matt was a good speaker anyway, but everyone got better when they started hearing themselves. When I speak, I listen to myself because I want to hear what I say. And even today, I will listen to recordings of my talks sure, so that I can figure out anything that I can do to improve. And we all don't like to hear ourselves talk, mm -hmm. but I've learned that I'm also not my own worst critic. I think that's also a negative way to look at it. I'm my own best teacher. Because mm. no one else can teach me. Mm. I've got to be the one to teach myself, even if it's getting input from instructors and all that. I'm the one that has to teach. And so when I take the time to do that, I will get better. And mm. as a result, of course, what that really means is I change. Mm. What a beautiful reframe. Not I am my own worst critic, but 
I have the power or capacity or potential to be my own best teacher. I love that. I love that. I love that. I think when we can also reframe change as being hard, as being a means to, you said the through line is they all got better. Change is a means for us to to recalibrate, reevaluate, to improve, enhance, or get better, then we become more willing to embrace it and build the new uh, and improved uh, or enhanced and evolved version of whatever it is. Right. Change is is something that is around us. And the other part about change is if we really look at something that is trying to get us to change, whatever it is, If we truly recognize that there is a something there, then we can analyze that. And so say to ourselves, do I really want to change this? Mm. But then Mm. you make it a real conscious decision. Now, things happen that we don't have control over. Did we have control over the World Trade Center terrorist attacks happening? Mm. No. Should we have? I'm not convinced yet that we would have been able to know that. Mm. But it doesn't really matter. I didn't have control over it. Uh, yeah. The other people who were there didn't have control over it. But what we did have control over was how we chose to deal with it after it occurred. Mm, amen. Amen. I love that. Just for anyone who's listening in my community, can you quickly share uh, what you experienced on that day, 9-11? Well, I worked in the World Trade Center on the 78th floor of Tower One, and I was in the office because we were going to be conducting some seminars that day to teach our reseller partners how to sell our products. When the plane hit, the building actually flexed because tall buildings are like big springs. When it got vertical again, a colleague saw fire above us, but I had spent a lot of time in the the, the year and a half before actually September 11th happened. I spent a lot of time learning what to do in the case of an emergency and learning all about the World Trade Center. Because I was the leader of that office. So I had to be able to function like any other leader would, which Mm. meant I had to know what to do and where to go. And even more so than most people, because I didn't have the uh, opportunity to rely on signs. So I learned it all. But what I realized much later was that was also helping me develop a mindset that said, you don't need to be afraid if there's an emergency, you know what to do. And you know what your options are as to where to go based on whatever the circumstances are. So don't panic. And I never realized that I learned that, but I did. Mm. And so I was able to go down the stairs. I had my guide dog at the time, Roselle, and we traveled down the stairs, all 78 floors. Mathematically, if I recall right, it was 1,463 stairs. Wow. But, wow. you know, it was at least we were going down, right? But the, <laughs> That's nice comic relief. I love that. But the <laughs> issue is that we um, we went down and we got out and then we were very close to Tower 2 when it collapsed. Mm-hmm. That was a little bit different station, situation because there I, I think I started to to panic a little bit. But mm. as I wrote in Thunderdog, things happened that that helped to deal with that. And we did write a book later about it called Thunderdog, the story of a blind man, his guide dog and the triumph of trust which is available anywhere books are sold. So hopefully people will will get that and keep my current guide dog, Alamo and Kibbles. We appreciate that. But, you know, the, the issue is that I discovered during COVID, and I want to talk about your changes in COVID, yeah. but I discovered that while I talked about not being afraid, I never really spent any time helping other people learn how to control their fear. And as I put it, not being blinded by fear when Mm. something unexpected happened. So we're writing a new book about that and uh, it'll be out when it comes out. But the whole idea is to say, you do have the ability to deal with whatever comes along. You can choose to create a mindset that will allow you to do that and not allow your fear to overwhelm you. It isn't to say you aren't afraid. I guarantee you, we were afraid going down the stairs, but I used it as a positive motivator to be more observant, to encourage my guide dog to go down the stairs. And the job of a guide dog, of course, is not to lead, but to guide. So the dog Mm -hmm. doesn't know where I want to go and how to get there. That's not the dog's job, but the dog's job is to keep us safe. But I knew that my dog was going to sense all the fear of everyone going down the stairs. So I had to encourage her to focus and do well. And, And we did. We got out and we survived. And I've been a a speaker traveling the world talking about trust and teamwork and dealing with change um, 
and the human animal bond and moving from diversity to inclusion, one of my favorite speeches, but doing a lot of talks around the world ever since. So I'm a full-time public speaker in, in addition to working for Accessibly. So as a plug, um, and of course, to any of your friends who might need a speaker, let me know. We're always looking for speaking opportunities. And it's been a while since I've been to Toronto, so I got to get back there. There you go. Well, I, I just, I think your story is so remarkable, Michael, and that you've used it to be of service to others across all those buzzwords that carry a lot of significance, right? And they hold real meaning to people. When 9-11 happened for me, I was in the fifth grade <laughs> and it was a year of change for me because it was actually the first year I had transferred from private Catholic school to public school. Mm. And, um, you know, there's, there's a, what's the word I'm, I'm searching for. There's something in an 11 year old boy or girl, whomever at that age that is uh, striving to find themselves in a new environment. Right. Yeah. And so when we talk about mindset, the mindset of, um, a child at that time is, Hey, transferring schools. It's, it's maybe there's some grieving, a sense of loss and welcoming in that. And there's an opportunity to gain new friends or widening your circles, you know, yeah. bridge the gap between the two schools. So I just, I love that in the midst of all that adversity and things that you couldn't control, um, your mindset was one in which it stayed calm and, <laughs> um, was able to uh, self-regulate is also, I think what came up for me is, is be able to get yourself to a place of, of safety. My equivalent to your story is that when I was 13, I was in the eighth grade and was in November of 1963 and president Kennedy was shot. Mm. And we had to deal with all of that. Sure. Um, it was a little bit more removed, of course, than being in the World Trade Center. But the next summer, I went and got my first guide dog and then went into high school and, and had to do the same sorts of changes that, that you did. And I did embrace it as I get to go into a whole new world. And I think that's the issue is that we learn to be so negative and pessimistic about things rather than recognizing maybe life is an adventure and yeah, we should yeah. really embrace more of the adventure. The internet is a great treasure trove of knowledge. And I love the net. I realize that there's a dark side to it, which I've never visited and don't have any need to, <laughs> but it's like artificial intelligence and chat GPT and so on today. Again, we can always look for the negatives, but why do we need to, to be negative about everything? Why don't we look for the positive things, recognizing that there are negative issues that we might have to deal with, but if we approach it the right way, one will take care of the other. Of course, just because there's real issues going on doesn't mean they need to be approached from a negative mindset or outlook. I, I think negativity is such a, a dream killer for lack of a better word. And I'm, if you can't tell already big glass half full kind of guy I, on my report card, probably even that same fifth grade year, my teachers would have written enthusiastic. That was my calling card. Um, I, I use enthusiasm as fuel to embrace change, to, to build the new. And instead of fighting the old, how do we navigate this with more, or how do I navigate this with more confidence and how do I navigate it with more inner kindness, the way I'm speaking to myself in my own developmental journey, uh, navigating the new. So that's, I guess that fast forwards us back to, to present day, what, what happened during COVID and the result of it, BCK, my private, um, coaching, speaking and consulting practice is, uh, the football club I was working for Roma, we, we sold it during 2020 year. And I mentioned, I made a pandemic pivot into sports media, uh, tried something out. I thought at that time, content's King, everybody's at home. You know, this is a good place to be, to negotiate live uh, sports media rights. But unfortunately that wasn't my reality. And, um, you mentioned having agency to choose. I think that's so important. And if I could have gone back to college and known that I had agency to choose a different major than I would have. And I would have done it with discernment and confidence. Um, but in this case, it was the first time in my professional career that I realized I have agency to walk away from this because I'm destined for something greater. And so I 
after one year of, of learning the business, I stepped away. I resigned and it was actually empowering instead of, I think so many people um, feel that quitting is a bad thing. And I, I like to think of, do you need to grit through this or do you need to quit this? Cause it's not in alignment with what makes you feel alive. And so um, in my case, I'd done all the gritting I could do. It was time to quit, not grit. And I, I started my own business, BCK, which stands for Be Confident and Kind. How do we get people to be more confident in a time of change or when they're, when change comes to them? Sure. It's such a good question. I think in my own experience, and there's probably other perspectives on this, in the midst of so much newness, I like to find slivers of sameness. So whether that's um, a fitness modality that serves you. So in my case, I love going to a yoga class or a spin class or a Barry's uh, boot camp class, a format that I know and that brings me confidence that when I'm done, I know I'll feel better in the midst of so much newness, lean into things where you can have just like a little sliver of sameness it will remind you that you are an expert in some things. And even though you may feel a beginner in whatever it is, I feel like a beginner finding the new grocery store in my neighborhood in Toronto, but in time you will grow more confident of, I prefer this one over that one, or it's worth the extra commute to go to that one. I know how to navigate it with confidence, get my groceries, get in and out. Um, so I, I tell my clients that confidence is a doing energy. It's action oriented and if you're taking actions or steps, it will build your confidence in time. You just have to be moving in forward direction, um, in a direction that's serving you. Uh, because if you're languishing, then you're going to stay in that stuck or stagnant place. Right. And it's all about moving. Mm -hmm. And as you're moving, thinking about what you're doing. The other part about it is really analyzing what we do. I love to tell people... Yeah that I think one of the most important things we can do is at the end of the day, take a little bit of time just to do um, self-examination, looking at what happened during the day and totally. even the good things. Could I have done it better? How did that go? Why did it go the way it did? The, the bad things, not why did I do so badly, but what do I do to make sure that that doesn't happen again or what really happened? Mm -hmm. Self-examination is such an important thing. It is. Do you journal, Michael? No, I don't write things down just because, um, you know, it's, it's, if I write it down, it's still out of sight, out of mind. I have to make a very conscious effort then to go back and look at the journal. So I just tend to remember things a lot. Well, let me, let me clarify, because that's probably good for listeners. Do you digital journal or have any sort of um, voice memos that you record and like listen back to kind of going back to the feedback thing around the radio station or is it purely just a mental exercise for you for me it's more of a mental exercise i find that that works pretty well if mm. if something comes to mind and i feel i need to to write it down somewhere then i will record it you know i'll make a note and i have done that and gone back to it or if i want to remember something in 6 months I will create a reminder so it will remind me. So I do some of that. But mostly, I just think about things at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. And I've learned, to, but I've learned to do that, right? Sure. So sure. I'm not saying that journal doesn't help. Journaling doesn't help. But I've learned to do it mentally. And so for me, that has worked pretty well. Of course. And what a great way to condition yourself to to do that self-examination, that mindfulness practice. I I work with my clients to have a very clear evening routine to set them up for success, so to speak, the next day. And then a morning ritual um, in the morning asking, what's my intention for the day? And then in yeah. the evening, um, am I satisfied? And because I think so many people, their head hits the pillow and they're thinking about what they didn't get done, which is mm -hmm. a lack mindset, as opposed to being grateful uh for the things they did and and so a gratitude practice is something during the pandemic i actually had to um i started experimenting with and writing down three things i'm grateful that the sun came out today in london i'm grateful i got to read 10 pages in my book i'm grateful that we cooked a delicious home cooked meal you know and it's it's those little simple things that remind you 
of how abundant and, and special your life is, even if you're living in lockdown <laughs> in a global pandemic. Yeah. And the reality is that we can take a much more positive approach to anything that we do, but it's mm. a conscious decision to do that. Mm. And there's no reason for us to be so negative. The problem is mm. we also do have so many political leaders and other people who we regard as role models who are very negative and mm. that doesn't help either. And so we have to be able to learn to step back and say, wait a minute, do I really want to model that when it's so negative or do I want to look at alternatives? And that doesn't mean that you look at things through, as they say, rose colored glasses, yep. but it does mean that you need to recognize that there is much more value and positive advancement than running things down and being negative. Absolutely. I think being able to, d to discern what works for you is so important in life. And that goes back to my own gut instincts. It's great to, for things to be modeled, but that doesn't mean we can carbon copy everything. We have to um, really get curious and play scientists on ourselves to figure out what works for us. Because uh, I think sometimes if we look to too many role models, we lose sight of our own intuition and uh, we're no longer operating according to our code of conduct, but another. And it leaves room for disappointment when they let us down or judgment and we're not being discerning of uh, our own experience and the fact that we're all human, we're all figuring it out. <laughs> well, you talk about inner kindness and yeah. it's, an, it's an important thing. We need to learn to be kind to ourselves and we, oh, yeah. we don't do that. Mm -hmm. So I, I call myself a recovering perfectionist, Michael, um, releasing a lot of the type a, uh, expectations of myself, the shoulds and, uh, speaking kindly of, you said it best earlier, I can be my own best teacher instead of I, I'm, I'm speaking critically of myself. So I, I remember the first couple months I moved here in Toronto, it might've been the first couple weeks. In fact, I had taken one of those blender balls, you know, like a protein shake with mm -hmm. me and it was so cold out. I didn't have gloves on and I dropped it. And of course the way the water bottle hit, it cracked and my protein shake went everywhere. And I thought, oh man, I just cracked my, my blender ball. Like I'm gonna have to go buy another one. And I noticed this negative self-talk I was engaging in. And then I caught myself. I just said, oh, well, you know, next time wear gloves, it's, it's, <laughs> it's a thing. It can be replaced all good. Yeah. Your hands are sticky, but you still have your fingers like, oh, well. And so embracing the, oh, well, like I'm, I'm, I'm not perfect. I, I wasn't intended to be perfect has been so liberating in my own journey. Yeah. We, we need to recognize all sides, but we need to really remember that we have control over how we deal with things. And that's, that's ultimately it. You know, there are some changes that are very overwhelming. I mean, the world trade center, mm -hmm. uh, the pandemic and so on. How do we deal with protecting our own mental health during these kind of incredible seasons of change. Mm. I love that question just as a, as an advocate for mental health, especially for men. Cause I find um, women do a really good job of asking for help, opening up, being vulnerable. Men have a tendency to wanting to be stoic or not show any cracks in the facade, hold it in um, or play into traditional gender norms. I need to be the provider. I can't show any emotion, just, just do. And so we all have mental, taking care of our mental health is important to everyone. And in times of change, it can seem on the surface, like this is overwhelming. This is a lot, but really when we look underneath, I almost think of like the tip of an iceberg asking ourselves, what am I really experiencing? What am I feeling? And taking measures that calm that anxiety, whether it's going on a walk, <laughs> um, cooking yourself a, a nutritious meal. I find that, um, you know, past seasons of life, when I, when we moved home to Texas during the pandemic, we were so excited for fast food, <laughs> for Chick-fil-A and things that maybe yeah. we've been deprived of for a year. And then I started noticing my mood and I, I tell friends, clients, food affects your mood. So it's um, taking care of ourselves with what we're eating, 
how we're uh, we're moving is so important. I think not just for what may seem like physical health on on the surface, but really it actually does impact our mental health too. Well, you you've said it several times, doing things like taking a walk and so on. The reality is that we do better again when we step back. We're in the middle of something, we feel overwhelmed. If we can step back and gain perspective, yeah. then we learn how to deal with it. And that's the other part about it. We're so conditioned to work hard, work all the time, and and not do any kind of self-analysis mm-hmm. that we don't learn to step back. When the people who do best are the ones who truly can step back, unplug. One of my favorite stories is when BlackBerry was still around the BlackBerry device and so on. Sure. Um, The company one day had a server failure and everybody's Blackberries died. They, Mm. They didn't work. Research in motion just wasn't getting anything to anyone. And I heard a few days later that there were even people who committed suicide because they couldn't connect at 12 o'clock at night, you know, Mm. and they didn't have any control over that. We don't Mm. learn to step back Mm -hmm. and deal with some of those issues and put it in perspective, which is what it's all about. Well, does change hurt our mental health? Do you think? Before I answer that, I, I, I want to address that case study you share because I find that fascinating and present day. I'm hearing so many Gen Z, the cohort below my millennial cohort are purchasing razor flip phones and other sort of non-smart devices, which I want to be clear, I think is great. If that, if, if taking that uh, measure helps protect your mental health, go for it. Cause we live in such an instantaneous society. Mm-hmm. What you call stepping back, I call reconnecting to myself, disconnecting from my smartphone and reconnecting to myself. Um, it's as silly as it sounds. We learn it on the playground, I think, or in some family, some households, like take a deep breath. You know, mm-hmm. if we take three deep breaths, we, um, it's scientifically proven and backed that we will feel a sense of calm and can come back to our sense of self or reconnect ourselves. Um, mm-hmm. So all that to say, to answer your question, do I think change is bad for our mental health? Absolutely not. I'm going to go with, with, with false. That's, that's fictitious. And I'll tell you why change is scary. And it's, 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 it's not intended to be, but that's our brain trying to protect us and keep us in that comfort zone. And like we talked about earlier, if we can realize that the brain is actually just trying to be our friend and whatever freeze, fight, flight mechanisms going off, um, it's saying proceed with caution, but it's not saying don't proceed at all. It's saying uh, try on the change, see if it works. And in time, you'll grow more comfortable with it. You'll see if it's, if it's, if it's, uh, if it's working for you. And then worst case, you can always change your mind and go back. I think in society, we forget that part too. If, if maybe we get it wrong, uh, or we want to go back, there's no shame in doing that. And so right. kind of releasing the expectation of, of changes incessant, it's, it's, uh, it's around us and we can always change our mind again. And there's nothing wrong with that. That's right. The the reality is that the whole idea behind change is you can you can look at it and as you said you can then change again and go back to the way it was or you'll probably never go back to exactly the way it was because even if you discover that whatever change you tried doesn't really work it still gave you more knowledge so you're still a different person than you were. Absolutely. 100% and I think that's really kind of important to uh, to remember. It's something that we we need to learn. Mm-hmm. I I've had a lot of changes happen in my life, and I, you know we all have. My latest probably huge change is my wife passed away last mm-hmm. November. Didn't really see it coming yeah. until very close to the time that it occurred. Mm-hmm. But now I live alone, um, except I have a a cat who wants to be petted every time she wants to eat. So I get her. Um, ministrations every day. And even in the middle of the night, she'll wake me up saying, feed me. And I'll do that once. I've told her you only get it once a night. And I have, of course, guide dog Alamo. So I have some company here and other people who come and help. But 
it's a it's an incredible change. And I've heard other people when they had a loved one pass, how could you do that to me? I'm mad at you for doing it. And I cannot say in any way, shape, or form that I resent Karen's passing. I didn't like it. Yeah. I'm very sad about it. Mm. I also tell people that I will not move on from Karen. I'll move mm. forward, but I won't move on because I'm not going to forget her. And I'm sure that she's watching from somewhere. And if I misbehave, I'm going to hear about it. So, you know, I, I have to do that. But the the reality is that it's still a huge change. And what it really did for me was cause me to learn to remember and use tools that I didn't have to use so much while we were married for 40 years. Mm -hmm. And that now I, I have to use some of those skills in a different way. Sure. But, you know, change happens. And one of the things that I feel is important is you can't be angry at change. You decide what you want to do with it. Yep. How do you want to respond to it? Yeah. What, what a beautiful way to to honor your your wife, Michael, your late wife. I I'm curious the new tools, or rather, maybe old tools that you've had to revisit by by doing it on your own and moving forward, um, not moving on from her. Has that brought you a sense of newfound confidence or self efficacy? Of I can, I don't, I don't, I wouldn't, I don't. Maybe I don't want to do it alone. I would prefer to have her here and. I'm confident in every day taking a new step, a new action. I'm curious what that looks like for you. Well, I think you just described it very well. The The reality is that um, I also did travel a lot while she was alive. So I'm, I'm used to not always being home, but the, the other part of it is that I'm reminded that I do have the skills to be able to function and do things and be able to, live and move and grow. And I'm going to continue to do that. And I think in part, that's also honoring her. Yeah. Amen. Live, move and grow. I love that. So it is a kind of an important thing to do. So well, thank, thank you for sharing that, Michael. I know it's grief is so complex and it's, yeah. it's not a linear process. So I, I really commend you for opening up in this forum. It's, it gives people permission to open up about a uh, similar loss. Well, thank you. I, you know, um, I will always honor her and remember her and that's the way it ought to be. Amen. Yeah. If there were one thing that you could change in the world, what would it be? Hmm. How long can my list be? I know you said one. I'm th- one I'm thing. Th- I'm thinking of Christmas, <laughs> like, Hey, Santa Claus, I want world peace, you know, solve <laughs> hunger. Uh, where do we start? Oh, you know, I, I, I've always been fascinated by people and human connection. What makes the earth spin on its axis isn't um, super heroes like spinning planet earth. It's, it's, it's um, we make the world go around with the decisions we make and not just the things we do, but the, the way in which we embody doing it like our actual beings. So I think I would, um, I would love for there to be more harmony that starts from leaders, from leaders around the world. Um, and, and that may sound a bit like woo woo, like world peace, but I, I really believe that if we led from servant hearted leadership, um, if everyone believed they had the capacity to lead um, and, and tapped into uh, cultivating confident and kind actions, then this would be an even better planet to live on. Well, I absolutely agree with you. If we really would go back to the whole idea of servant leadership, servant hearted leadership, and truly brought that into being around the world, it would be a much better thing. But unfortunately, you know, right now we've got too many people who are in it for them and they're not, they're not recognizing how much better they would be if they truly learned to be the servant leaders that they probably could be. And if they can't do that, then they really shouldn't try to be leaders. And we need to recognize that and feel empowered to say to them, if you can't really be a servant to lead appropriately, 
then we're not going to accept that and we're not going to accept you. And we haven't really learned to do that either. Yeah. To me, what you describe is not leadership, right? If that's the approach you take with special interest, um, especially personal interest, right? Um, it's, 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 put whatever label you want on it. Um, but it's, I know for a fact, it's not leadership. And as somebody who works with leaders on a daily basis and am still a work in progress with my own leadership style and learning what works for me, if we can get really curious about that and, um, treat ourselves kind on that developmental journey and others, then I guarantee there would be more confident leaders out there that are doing the quote unquote, right things that serve the greater population. And that's where we'd see accessibility for all sustainable, like future of work that, um, that people want to be a part of a collective vision for a better tomorrow. And that's the name of the game. Yeah, absolutely. Tell me a little bit about, about BCK coaching. Sure. So BCK coaching is for both individuals and organizations. Uh, individuals, I do private one-on-one coaching with leaders, ones that are looking to, um, navigate what I like to call life's daily challenges, the small ones, but also life's big transitions. Some we see coming, others we don't with more confidence and kindness. A common theme is careers, right? It's where we spend the majority of our work day. Um, and it's, it's been really fun for me to hold space for people in that capacity and help them unpack wisdom from within. Similarly on the, the, the corporate side, it's cultivating leadership in workplaces at all levels, executives, new managers leading for the first time, and then individual contributors who have, um, aptitude to become a leader. So I, I enjoy working with smaller to mid-sized companies that actually have a runway for scaling and growth and really get in, um, and be a change agent for good and drive positive impact. That's cool. You do it all over the world or where are your clients? I do do it all over the I do do it all over the world, uh, which is cool because I have a Rolodex for my time spent in Europe. I now can say I have a North American uh, Rolodex adding Canada to the mix. But uh, clients have ranged from markets, including uh, Paris, France, the Netherlands, uh, individual clients from both coasts, San Francisco, all the way to to New York, to Brooklyn. So it's, uh, you know, there's a saying, all roads lead to Rome, Michael, but I, I laugh. I say my Texas roots, though, all all roads ultimately lead back to the great state of Texas. And my community there has been super supportive of my journey. And I feel like I'm just getting started. So it's it's an honor to talk to other thought leaders such as yourself who are giving me a platform to to share what we're about. Well, it's it's exciting. It's exciting to hear about and we're going to have to do this again in the future so we can hear about some of the adventures going forward with coaching and, and the things that you're doing. But if people want to reach out to you, how do they do that? If they want to learn more about what you do, engage you and so on, what's the process? It's a great question. Uh, process is threefold. You can reach me on the World Wide Web. Um, we're Refreshing my website um, ahead of our one-year anniversary on July 1. New domain is beconfidentandkind.com. Um, I'm acting And on, A-N-D or the and symbol? Uh, A-N-D. A -N -D. Yeah, no, no and symbol. That's a okay. great question. Be confident and kind. Uh, I'm also on LinkedIn, uh, just given my my background in, in sport and let's call it the corporate world. Uh, in Instagram, like watch out world, you know, I was very... Um, I thought that was a place to, you know, show what I was cooking, right? Like it, like this is like a pie account now. People like putting pies that they baked during the pandemic. But I actually put a lot of thought leadership on Instagram around uh, what it means to to be a servant hearted leader and to navigate change with more confidence and kindness. So yes. they can follow me on any of those channels. Get in touch for a free consultation, and then we're off to the races. So on Instagram, it's Watch Out World. I wish um, that would be good. <laughs> it would have, would have been awesome if I got that domain way back when. It's simply uh, my name, Milam R. Miller uh, on Instagram. And you can find me, Milam Miller on LinkedIn. Um, but I'm very excited for the new website because I do believe everybody deserves to feel a more confident or the most confident and kind version of themselves. And that's what we explore and that's what we make happen. Cool. Well, of course... 
I would be remiss if I didn't say we hope you'll put accessibility on the site to make sure that the uh, website is accessible for for people with disabilities, but we can talk about that later. Let's offline on that. I I want to be a, an ally and an advocate for that. So uh, we'll, we'll do that. We'll do that. Well, for the rest of you out there, we'd love you to use accessibility too. But in the meanwhile, I'd love to hear your thoughts about today. Please feel free to email me, Michael H I. M-I-C-H-A-E-L-H-I at Accessibe, A-C-C-E-S-S-I-B-E dot com. Or you can go to our podcast page, www.michaelhingson, M-I-C-H-A-E-L-H-I-N-G-S-O-N dot com slash podcast. We'd love to hear your thoughts, love to hear your comments. And of course, we do appreciate five-star ratings. So if you would give us a five-star rating, uh, I would appreciate it. And I know Milam would as well. But We really feel it's important that we do hear from you and get your thoughts. If any of you, Milam, including you, know of anyone else who might be a good guest for our podcast, love to hear from you, love introductions. We're always looking for more people and more adventures to have on Unstoppable Mindset. So Milam, again, I want to thank you and really appreciate you taking so much time. We've now done this for an hour and uh, my gosh, 14 minutes. So we've been on quite a while. So I I want to want to thank you for being here with us. Well, you know, I'm a talker, Michael. So if you give me a mic, then especially when we're talking sports, that's fun. Well, we definitely need to do this again and see how the PGA Tour live uh, conundrum, how it all shakes out. I think that'll be fun. Well, thank you again for being here. Thank you. I appreciate it.